are revealing their enormous benefits, greater productivity, faster availability, less administrative work, and of course, the spatial separation of physicians and patients, which is even more important in today's world of COVID-19. In the future, we will be undergoing a paradigm shift from white digital to why still analog. So the future today is digital. And uh, from the risk opportunity debate of private data privacy <laughs> versus digital processes, a concept of how can we achieve both in the shortest amount of time will arise. Now, talking about um, how we see the future. So the future of healthcare will be smart network systems which support the medical personnel. The patients will benefit from personalized diagnostics and therapies. And one of the challenges which we see in this process is the need to have a greater standardization across healthcare systems. If the care providers push for more customized solutions, then it will make it harder to share healthcare data effectively across systems. And uh, a trend which we see is the Internet of Medical Things, or in short, IOMT, that is enhancing the connectivity and also alternating the doctor-patient relationships. The data is sent from those things to the physicians via the Internet, but the information can also flow through to broader databases and analytics systems will enhance shared research and feed the AI. Uh, the Internet of Medical Things is also enabling the next generation of connected healthcare, driving what we call today healthcare 4.0. So healthcare 4.0 refers to the latest evolutionary stage of healthcare digitalization in which advanced analytic software AI is helping the doctors and hospital managers to make more accurate diagnosis and better treatment decisions. The huge volumes of data that are flowing into the cloud, not just from doctor's office and imaging centers, but also from remote devices and sensors worn or operated by patients. And the data is helping to shape better informed healthcare management decisions while raising hopes for significant gains in efficiency and cost control in the coming future. So the future is healthcare 4.0. Thanks, Dot. That was insightful. We'll hear from Geeta and Steve as well. Well, I'll go, um, Geeta, if that's okay. So, for me, what's important here is the idea of uh, patient centricity. Having a consult, uh, consultation with a doctor via Zoom is one thing. We saw we saw earlier how critically important that is, and how much that's increasing. But being treated remotely or virtually is the next level. So we're seeing this increasing trend in the shift of point of manufacture. You think about you know, the supply chain that has to serve healthcare. We're seeing a shift in the point of manufacture resulting from the impact that patient centricity is having on the already complex supply chains that serve healthcare. Healthcare and life sciences really are becoming one. Traditionally, the latter served the former, but they're coming together. Now, point of manufacture is getting closer and closer to the patient's hospital bedside or the clinic that they visit or the drugstore in town or ultimately their home. You know, we, we just heard uh, about similar things from, um, from GE Healthcare. So for us at Sparta, we, we have to sort of proactively solve for the quality and compliance challenges that this shift is bringing, that this patient centricity shift and this shift in the point of manufacture is bringing. So we have to answer questions like, what quality management systems will we need to enable things like 3D printed medical devices being manufactured in a surgical suite or precision or personalized medicines delivered for a unique genome in a batch of one, again, at a patient's point of care. You know, how do you release, uh, you test and release such unique products? How do you manage what will inevitably be, you know, the need for, for recall of such product? We have to answer these questions 
and then put solutions in place to enable such an amazing, amazing vision. The, the, the innovation on the product is happening so rapidly. We have to make sure that product quality, safety, efficacy, continuity of supply, and of course, a complex global regulatory compliance needs. We have to make sure all of those are met um, to really enable you know, the, 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 the vision that the product is bringing. So those solutions, those systems, they'll be a step change compared to those of yesterday, if you, if you know what I mean. Uh, so, uh, adding on, uh, first of all, uh, great to be part of the panel, uh, an esteemed panel, and also after a wonderful uh, session by, uh, you know, from, from uh, GE. Uh, um, so, in that context, right, when we look at COVID, uh, uh, one of the main things that's changing post-COVID scenario, as you mentioned, is, I believe, uh, non-critical care outside the hospital, right? I mean, there is more and more affinity towards home care, uh, home screening, uh, for diseases, you know, home diagnostics, and literally uh, sort of the need for point of care devices, you know, which can be uh, can be used to do uh, early detection and early screening for non-COVID uh, type of diseases. Just because COVID is there, obviously there's huge demand in the hospital, um, and also, you know, the shortage of staff because, uh, you know, some of the doctors don't want to come uh, to the hospital and so on and so forth. And so the demand has now shifted outside the hospital, particularly for non-COVID uh, and also, of course, uh, COVID uh, cases as well. So uh, apart from the point of care devices, which can be uh, used by health workers, nursing staff, so that uh, you provide the scale of diagnostics, you know, where the automated, automated devices or automation itself can actually take on uh, some of the burden out for, like, you know, as was mentioned in the previous talk, or triaging, right, using AI and other devices, uh, AI-enabled devices, for example, is, is something that's going to sort of see a lot of uh, um, adoption. And self-diagnostic devices, I would say, that is wearables, you know, they can just sensing, but also what if the wearables and the uh, software associated with it, maybe on a mobile app or a solution which is, uh, you know, all in all edge-based, uh, you know, uh, smart interpretation of these sensing, right? So what I would say, the end user doing some kind of self-diagnosis or self-triaging, uh, you know, is probably going to sort of, you know, uh, come up. And of course, this would be uh, doctor-led, uh, you know, there will be telehealth associated with it, video conferencing with the doctor, for example, as soon as you check your BP, you know, show, show the readings and sort of, you know, integrated environment of where multiple of these devices are throwing up the uh, sensing information. And there's a smart uh, environment, probably AI enabled, uh, which is interpreting it and then showing the interpreted data as well as the raw data, if you will, to the doctor who is remote, uh, you know, for final, final uh, diagnosis, right? And here, uh, this is not just in, going to be in urban, this is going to be a huge difference, even to rural healthcare, where, uh, you know, uh, there are quite a few people who can afford it. It's just the, uh, the remoteness creates a huge thing. So suddenly the target segment of these hospitals can be beyond the urban cities, right? You know, they can actually reach out to rural areas, patients there, and people there also can get very good, uh, you know, uh, early healthcare uh, facilities, uh, you know, through these mental, uh, through these uh, methodologies. And also, I feel like, you know, we talk about healthcare, we also always talk about uh, diagnostics, devices, and so on. We see more and more uh, requirement for mental health related, uh, you know, issues and uh, devices and therapies and, and, and bots and so on. So I guess even the mental health forms, you know, you know the, the part of the future, um, you know, care, I would say healthcare as such. There was also quite a few uh, references to radiology, right? Being remotely, radiological images being read uh, remotely uh, by doctors and so on. And uh, AI being uh, a triaging, uh, you know, setting, like uh, providing the triaging to figure out who and which of these uh, images need to be read by whom and when and re reprioritization and so on and so forth. I think I firmly believe, in fact, you know, that artificial intelligence and machine learning based. Uh, uh, devices and solutions are going to be uh, making a huge difference. You know, whatever we have seen so far is only, uh, you know, the tip of the iceberg. There is a huge, uh, um, you know, solutioning that you will see, uh, you know, for service delivery, operational efficiency, and also clinical care, where artificial 
intelligent machine learning based algorithms are uh, uh, are, are making already inroads and are going to be a huge uh, uh, impact you know to the future of healthcare in particular i would sort of just call it out as uh, the future of healthcare is actually a coupling of human and machine enabled solutions you know delivering personalized uh, diagnostics therapeutics and in general healthcare uh, which is uh, available for all you know be it in urban or rural setting right you know available for all this human machine enabled solutions are going to rule the world uh, and and enable uh, the world to be more healthier hey, thanks geeta thanks for touching upon ai and machine learning as well in fact this is going to be our next topic and we now realize how important it is for telemedicine as well so if you look at ai so there's been a lot of uh, use cases that have penetrated across the ecosystem so we're talking about drug discovery image scanning and the likes so the multiple startups in the space as well so going forward what do you think be the key role of ai across the ecosystem and how does the startup ecosystem really change so geeta i know this topic is really close to your heart but we'll let gerd talk <laughs> first and then, we, and, and then we'll get back to you on the closing comments for this yeah sure so uh, yeah it is uh, very very close to my heart and uh, i firmly firmly believe that ai based solutions um are are critical like i mentioned before and uh, it's a huge opportunity for startups to make a difference because almost every disease requires a different ai and machine learning model i would say machine learning to be specific so um, you know it's it's a lot of work for a single corporate to do like you know uh, 2000 diseases so this is also an uh, a niche play that every startup can do uh, you know a startup uh, can look at one particular disease and and go into the depth of it from a domain perspective what kind of data is needed to actually do some kind of early diagnosis in that particular disease and, and so on and so forth uh, if i take an example of our own startup you know uh, you know entrepreneurs are always like that find any uh, platform talk about your startup yes so niramai basically we do breast cancer detection using thermal imaging and ai and uh, it does make a huge difference because once you start using thermal imaging all of the x-ray related uh, you know um, issues go away one of the re reduced radiation and also the fact that uh, women under 45 years of age uh, cannot have a uh, accurate uh, screening uh, methodology because of the density issues so that also goes away and uh, thermal imaging uh, along with ai uh, you know um, has you know uh, at niramai we have actually been able to create a completely uh, very very new uh, kind of a breakthrough kind of a, a solution uh, which can perform as well or you know in some cases uh, better than a mammography so it's more of a nature there are some segments where the existing things existing devices may perform better and there are some gaps you know because of which many many women are dying because of lack of uh, screening methodologies uh, for early detection and so that's the gap the, uh, for example our startup is um, you know addressing and then uh what i have seen in the last 4 years of our startup actually work itself is that uh, uh you know um definitely the algorithms are improving it's more practical now to actually uh, develop and deploy a solution be it in a very very tertiary you know very very sophisticated tertiary care hospital or a primary care hospital or a diagnostic center or even a remote area you know so so this whole thing is made possible because of these ai enabled devices right uh, at least in our case right so and also it enables the urban doctor to scale well because uh, most of the initial work uh, about screening and so on is already taken care of by the device and then of course there's always a review and uh, you know final diagnosis that the doctor does but that enables uh, the doctor to serve many many more patients because his her, her productivity has increased very very hugely and same way it helps to scale in the rural areas because now there is an ai doctor at the edge and then only uh, critically ill patients or people who require immediate attention only those are coming to the hospital and so uh, you know there is a pretty much uh, some kind of a provisional uh, uh, you know diagnostics or uh, something that the ai robot can actually take and do it and this can be done for every disease for that matter and that's where the huge scope for startups uh, lie i believe of course all this has to be regulated cleared and i am you know all that in process yeah thanks geeta now that we've seen it through a startup lens gerd is there anything you want to add from an enterprise or a large enterprise lens of course it's uh, relevant for us as well i mean we just uh, recently announced also a partnership uh, where we get to specifically in the startup environment let me first uh, talk a little bit about uh, how ai is uh, changing the uh, world how ai is shaping precision medicine 
and how AI is making healthcare patient centric. If you look at it today, we have primarily automated product solutions, and uh, tomorrow we will have intelligent machines that enable precision decision making with real time support and uh, machine learning powered image reconstruction. Post processing, more and more features will be moving from hardware to software. And in the future, what I mentioned before, Industry 4.0, it will be connected intelligence that expands the availability of healthcare across the globe. Um, if we look at it, what is possible already today, yeah, so primarily uh, AI is being used for um, image reading. Um, for example, we have a product that is called AI Red. Red stands for radiology companion platform, um, where we support radiologists in the analysis of uh, specific images, depending on the modality, depending on the body part. For example, we have a uh, chest CT read application for other organs and other modalities as well. And the next step would be the machine intelligence decision-making, so-called pathway companions. This is also a platform that we are developing. And uh, the pathway companion will support, based on AI, the clinical decision support system. And if you continue this, the very next step would then be a digital twin of an individual. And uh, the digital twin, in principle, basis will be imaging, then you have the vital signs of an individual, you have the laboratory data, you have the genomics, you have behavioral data of an individual, how much he does exercise, um, and so on and so forth. And you also have, let's say, social determinants, and based upon that, you will be able to simulate and virtualize, in principle, um, the whole life of an individual, you will be able to make outcome prediction of an intervention, but you will also be able to make uh, predictions about um, whether or not a certain individual will become a disease if he continues with his behavior or with his social determinants. And of course, you can also simulate what happens if he changes this. Now, if you look at the complexity of all of this, the digital twin with all those different topics, um, of course, this is something where we as an MNC work at, but you can easily imagine that there are so many topics where you also need specialized teams focusing on different areas. This is where the Indian startup environment uh, comes up because there are many, many topics that are being looked into and with the huge area for cooperation for us today, but also in the future on the way to the digital twin. Great, good. So another interesting area is the increased usage of robotics. The robots have now evolved beyond, uh, you know, handling materials in warehouses to helping with surgery. So it's kind of a science fiction movie already. And COVID has accelerated the usage of such robots. So just wanted to understand if this trend is here to stay and, and you know, what, what is that we can expect in this space? So Ram is at the heart of innovation at Striker and he'll be best poised to answer this question. Thanks, Shivaram. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is great to be uh, part of this panel uh, today. So robots have found acceptance in uh, surgical space, primarily to drive uh, better clinical outcomes for patients because they get a personalized surgical experience based on their specific diagnosis and anatomy. If you look at a car assembly line or any other application, you see robots uh, are driving throughput and efficiency. But whereas in surgeries, it's not, it's not to drive efficiency, although that's one of the uh, you know, benefits you get. The patient is in the center, and the uh, better clinical outcome for the patient is primarily where robots help. Now, within my world uh, of orthopedics, uh, robotics first uh, found application in uh, partial knee replacement surgeries. If you look at this, this is a very complex and demanding procedure. You're operating in a very restricted visual field. You don't see everything you'd like to see. Because of that, uh, the potential for errors are very high. Uh, this is where robots play a specific role in increasing accuracy and reducing the errors. So I'll just briefly uh, talk about what the workflow is. Right? 
So how this procedure happens is, uh, you know, you, you take a CT scan of the patient. This scan is converted into a 3D model using what's called as uh, segmentation, right? So now you have a full 3D visual field of the surgical site. So not only do you see everything that you may not be able to see in the surgery, but you're also seeing it before the surgery, right? So you, be, before you even open up the patient, you have the full visual field. And you use this model to pre-plan the surgery, uh, particularly uh, in orthopedics cases, it's for implant placement and alignment. If the implant is not placed appropriately in the, in the right position or aligned appropriately, that's what results to bad outcome, results in bad outcomes. So there's almost like a map for the surgery, right? You, you're walking into a surgery with a Google map with a step-by-step -step directions. So, so now that's the uh, first piece of it. So the surgeon takes this map and goes into the surgery and executes the plan. So what's, what's very important to know here, uh, Shivam, is this is not like a science fiction movie. It's not just the robot uh, autonomously performing the surgery. It's, it's an, a robotically assisted surgery. So the surgeon is in complete control. Um, the surgeon basically controls where the robot is going and uh, gets the desired outcome. Where it helps is if you don't have robots and if you just have a pre-plan, you can still make a mistake. Right? You, uh, it's like, think about it, right? you have a road map, but you can still make a wrong turn. Right? And, then, and then you'll uh, readjust. But if you have a robot, the haptics of the robotic arm will not let you make the wrong turn. It's going to make sure that the surgeon is staying uh, the course. Uh, so you, you, you reduce any potential errors uh, that, you know, that may happen, human errors, and you achieve your desired uh, results more accurately. You know, in this case, let's like say for, uh, for orthopedics, like, you know, the ligaments are right next to the bone. Uh, and, you know, your novice surgeon may cut the ligament when he or she doesn't really want to cut the ligament. So think about what the difference it can make. It, you know that you're not supposed to cut the ligament, but if you go closer, the, the haptics will stop you from doing that. So, so this is where uh, robotics is play, uh, playing a big role, uh, reducing errors, improving accuracy, and uh, eventually increasing the, uh, the outcome that the patient uh, desires. So for surgeons, right, it's a repeatable procedure. You have a plan. For every, pa for every patient, you can have a plan. You can customize the plan, but it's repeatable, right? You can plan, you, can, you do a set of things that you need to do. So it's very repeatable. And for the patients, it's a, it's a predictable outcome. So to answer your question, robotics is here to uh, stay. And we are already seeing uh, better clinical outcomes. Uh, there's clinical data that exists uh, out there that says the revision rates, like say if the surgery is not performed well, you go and revise the surgery. So the revision rates are uh, going down. And, uh, and also like uh, data like post-operative pain that you get because of surgery is also lower. Uh, so this is only get better as we get more data out of it. Uh, at this point, uh, you know, we're focused on the clinical outcome aspect of it. And as we get more data, we will be applying analytics and uh, you know, AI and ML algorithms to make it even, even better. Thanks, Ram. That was insightful. So the future is not as scary as we imagine it to be. And you did mention about uh, you know safety uh, during your short talk as well. So all of us, I think, spoke about remote patient monitoring, smart implants, wearables, robotics, and so on. So in a post-pandemic world, so how does one alleviate cybersecurity concerns, quality and safety concerns as well? I mean, healthcare data has already been hacked multiple times in the past. So so how does one go about building a secure feature? Steve would love to hear from you on that. Um, well, as we know, this is a challenge already, right? And it, it's, uh, as was just said, it's not science fiction, it's here. Um, and, it, and it's a challenge that will continue to grow. It's, it's not, um, you know, it's not the stuff, the stuff of science fiction. I, I witnessed insulin pump hacks already, you know, years back, right? We know this, this is, a, this is an ongoing challenge. The growing presence and ability of these types of devices is, is really another outcome of patient centricity trend that we talked about, right? One thing we have to do is think beyond the specific product itself. Let's say the digital implantable device, let's say. We have to think 
of the entire ecosystem in which that device operates. For example, we have to think and plan for you know, the, the, the quality, safety, security, um, efficacy of the network that that device will use, all the way from the device to a connected physician, um, or as we heard earlier on, maybe to a whole network of connected physicians and, and, and uh, diagnostics. And then all the way back to the patient as an extension of that product, an essential element of the product. After all, without that network, the device, connected devices are not going to function, right? So what platform, ultimately cloud-enabled, will it operate on? We have to think of that platform as part of the product. So cybersecurity is one thing, but we really can't separate it from, you know, product quality, safety, and efficacy, um, and so on. I think of things like what validation will such connected devices and those extended systems require. Uh, it's a data problem. And it's a design quality problem, I think. Design quality is going to be paramount. We have a device that requires design control. It invariably will have software as a medical device embedded within it, which will require design control. But if you include that platform and that extended network through which the data moves, as you start to think about design for quality, design for manufacture, design for you know, post-market requirements, um, if you think about that platform, that network as part of the product, part of the system to, to allow it to be efficacious, then we have to design quality, safety, and security into that whole puzzle. I think that's an important thing for us to, to, to plan for. Perfect. Thanks. I think we'll move on to the last question, or you know, the last topic of discussion in the interest of time. So we've been looking at the entire pharma and life sciences industry. The way clinical trials are being conducted is also undergoing a paradigm shift. <coughs> Excuse me. So what do you think the future for pharmacovigilance and the post-market surveillance will look like? Um, again, I'll start, but I'll be brief. I mean, Real-world evidence through real-world data will have an increasingly important and greater role. So again, data is king. We talked about AI and machine learning earlier. These innovations will have significant impact, um, not only on product uh, and, and treatment and therapy and diagnostics, um, you know, development of AI and ML technologies is certainly outpacing our ability to adopt them broadly in life sciences and healthcare due to the complexities of regulations and so on. And I recently discussed the application of AI in, in the GX uh, compliance related to um, we're already delivering AI capabilities in areas such as complaint handling and post-market surveillance, root cause analysis, signal detection, and so on. And our customers often ask, well, what do the FDA say about that? Well, while there are emerging guidelines uh, and, and probably soon regulation around the application of AI in diagnostics and in treatment, in products, let's say, there are none yet in the quality system regulations so what the FDA do say is that we, industry, healthcare, um, technology solution providers, life sciences, manufacturers, you know, we as a, as, a, as a combined industry, we have the ethical obligation to use these innovations afforded to us, such as AI, in the service of public health. In other words, they say we must find a way together to assure widespread adoption of these disruptions for the betterment of patient outcome. But they're also clear that we can augment human decision making with it, not replace it, right? So, you know, those sorts of things are really important. And you take an MRI or a CT scan as an example, post-market surveillance, field correction, service, which are all integrally linked, they'll, they'll all be able to be managed, um, you know, through a digital ecosystem and, and the application of AI um, you know, will be really important there. So I think those are the sorts of things that you'll see. Um, you think about discovery, development, clinical scale up, and then production distribution all the way out through that entire product life cycle. We'll, we'll be able to look at that more holistically with AI. Um, and uh, it'll have a big impact on post-market surveillance um, and, and things like uh, uh, adverse event reporting and so on. 
thanks steve i think overall this has been a really great discussion so what we hear from all of you is it's not just going to be one technology there's going to be a confluence of technologies for instance ai ml iot robotics and so on and this is going to drive the future of healthcare hopefully our viewers will take something back to their enterprises and build an anti fragile future as well so uh, we did receive a lot of questions from the uh, viewer community as well but in the interest of time we'll be taking that offline and we'll get back to you so we'll conclude here and move on to the next uh, talk so thank you again for taking part in this panel discussion it was really insightful and exciting to host you all thanks thank you very much